You have this aesthetic you often use in your videos of illustrations and cartoons. Where did that come from? So if we're going back to, uh, to little JJ and how he imagined his life sort of unfolding, um, from a very young age, I sort of thought that I was going to be a cartoonist in some form. Like that was going to be my great sort of destiny in life. I always liked drawing. I loved drawing cartoons when I was a kid, when I was a teenager. You know, at one time, actually, I thought I was going to be, you know, maybe a video game, uh, you know, concept artist or something like that, or a comic strip illustrator. Like I had all these kind of dreams and they all involved uh, art and I went to art lessons and did all this kind of thing. I don't know, at some point I started getting more interested in politics, certainly like after 9-11, uh, I think, like many people of my generation, like that was a very sort of orienting moment for me in, in which I sort of started to realize that like politics actually was the most important thing and that we lived in times that were so serious that sort of frivolity was, was uh, you know, my cartoons must reflect the depressing nature of the world that's uh, unveiling itself to me. Yeah, more or less, right? And so it's like already by that point, around sort of 2001, I was already sort of getting interested in political cartooning specifically, editorial cartooning. Post 9-11, I just kind of really doubled down on it. And I, for a while, I actually tried very hard to become a professional political cartoonist. And, you know, I, I was published in some magazines and newspapers and things. You know, it, I never really quite made the breakthrough that I wanted. I never got a full-time employment as an editorial cartoonist. I never was sort of able to do more than just the occasional freelance political cartoon assignment. But, you know, I've always been really interested in cartooning and I've always loved to draw. And I think I, that passion has never kind of gone away from me. And so I still like my videos. I still occasionally include stuff that I've drawn, caricatures of politicians, which is still something I very much like to draw. But I guess the more relevant sort of aspect of this as part of my genesis is that when I would be drawing political cartoons, whether for my own blog or for other people's websites and stuff, I would often uh, write sort of accompanying essays to go along with it. Uh, I would call them my essays. People responded much better to my political writing than my political illustration. And so it was sort of through my political writing that was initially intended to supplement my political illustration and then wound up sort of eclipsing my political illustration that that was sort of how I first started to get like, quote unquote, serious media offers. And when I sort of first started to like slowly transition from being online art person to being a more substantial, you know, commentary person in the world of Canadian journalism. Like what form was that? W was that you were submitting to like old, you know, broadsheets? Here, I'm using the props. So, you know, mission accomplished. Or was this kind of like uh, national outlets or what, blogs or like what, what was that? I got different offers from different sorts of places. And it was just through my, my sort of online profile that I sort of came to their attention. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky. I've never really had to apply for many jobs in my life. Most of my opportunities have sort of been offered to me. I started to get picked up to do television commentary on CTV. When I was doing my own stuff, you know, I was, you know, JJ McCullough, you know, kind of anonymous writer or whatever. And then when I started doing television, then you start to become like, okay, now I'm starting to become JJ McCullough, you know, noted political pundit. And what it means to sort of be a pundit in the Canadian media sphere sort of became my new sort of identity for, I don't know, close to a decade. Yeah, and you, you have a video on um, pundits. And I remember that video because it felt like a quite personal, yeah, yeah, quite yeah. honest reflection on your own, like, place in the world. At one time... And this is like, it's, it's interesting to sort of reflect on it because it's very different than sort of like how I would have envisioned my life unfolding when I was a teenager or something, right? It's like at some point I started to sort of really become uh, entranced with the idea of being a pundit and being a like, uh, I mean, Ben Shapiro wasn't really as famous as he is, is now, but it's like, you know, being a Ben Shapiro type, for lack of a better word, like being a guy who's known for going on television, for sharing his political opinions for, you know, being on the radio and, you know, publishing and writing and just kind of like being a person who's sort of defined by their public profile and their public profile as a political commentator, as an analyst of sort of current events and stuff. And that became an identity that, I don't know, seemed really exciting to me. I mean, it's, it is glamorous on some level that you get to be on TV and you get to sort of like shape the conversation in some way by being one of the more high profile people that's sort of articulating you know, your views. But I suppose what I realized uh, in short time is that it is a very competitive industry. 
you know, there's a lot of people now and certainly in the internet era who kind of aspire to that, who want to make a living just basically talking about things that interest them on television or, or elsewhere. And because it's so attractive to so many people, you realize that there are sort of kind of like market forces in play. You know, you have to be like very outgoing, very aggressive, very confident in your demeanor. You know, producers like it when there's a lot of conflict on these types of shows. And I suppose as I got older, I realized that there was an aspect of me that as much as I enjoyed kind of the fame and glamour of the lifestyle, I started to realize that maybe I'm not as confident about politics and not as confident about the world as I initially thought I was as a as a youngster in my 20s. Maybe the world is and the world of politics is a little bit more complex and deserves a little bit more nuance in the way that people engage with it. And then that sort of made me realize that maybe I didn't want to be a Ben Shapiro type. I didn't want to be somebody whose sort of entire raison d'etre of their public persona is just picking fights with overconfident opinions. And so that's part of the reason why I don't really do that anymore. Have you ever noticed this effect where like once you get into the point that you're having a public dispute over a point that maybe was just an offhand comment or, or a thing you did one day, you can end up in this kind of vicious cycle of that starting to define your entire persona to the public. Like your career kind of goes off a rail into this fairly miserable like fighting with like uh, woke people or whatever about there some definitely issue. that was the other sort of thing I realized is that there's a personality type that is well suited to this kind of lifestyle the lifestyle of the pundit the professional commentator and some of it is that you kind of have to you know frankly get off on some level on the conflict on the drama on being controversial on picking fights you know in Ben Shapiro his own book he talks about like you know you have to be willing to like walk into the fire, you know, go for the fight, you know, never surrender an inch and like all of these kinds of things, which like to me, like a kind of more emotionally sensitive person, like is just not attractive. Like I don't aspire to be hated. Like I don't enjoy that. Like I don't like the idea. Like, uh, you know, Ben Shapiro sells like mugs where it's like leftist tears and it's like, oh, yum, yum. I like drinking. Like <laughs> Like, it's just not me, right? And I think I think it's also like it's not super productive, right? Like, you can maybe like aspire to radicalize people if you have that sort of mentality. But I don't think you're going to really ever persuade many people. I think more likely you'll just be popular with the people that are already inclined to agree with you than, you know, that you'll change any minds genuinely and that people like combative pundits, whether they're on the right or the left. You know, we're picking on Ben Shapiro, but there's certainly like no shortage of people who fulfill this role, particularly like in the social media era where you have like professional streamers. There's a lot of like, for example, very popular far left streamers who you know, are not at all persuasive, but people like them because they're fighters and they're combative and they will create drama and conflict. And that's exciting for people to watch and consume. You know, I kind of feel like that's maybe not what the world needs a big abundance of right now. And so in the kind of content I make now for my YouTube channel, I try much more harder than I ever did previously to be objective and to be fair and to be nuanced and to concede, you know, points on both sides. Because I, I kind of feel like now what is most important is is like is education and information and it's like clarity and giving people the tools that they need to understand the, the nuance of complex situations so that they can reach an informed, moderate opinion, which I think is probably more helpful and the only way that actual change will be made in this world. No, I do not hate Quebec. What I think about Quebec is that it is obviously a very different place from the rest of Canada. And I think that the Canadian government's efforts to accommodate those differences have resulted in some very bad policy. When you started off in like university, were you strongly politically aligned or, you know, because you've gone, you said like you you moved through C... Was was CTV... Is that like... um, Is that a Bell Media property or Rogers? Yeah, it was Bell Media. But that's pretty moderate. And then you went to Sun, right? And then that's kind of like... Uh, that's kind of a little bit harder to, harder to write. Yeah, that's right. Did you feel yourself kind of going down the slope and then pull out? Or yeah, like yeah, I think I did. Like, I mean, I always kind of like, you know, from a relatively young age, from the time I was a teenager, and certainly like sort of in the post 9-11 world, that was sort of part of my identity as a younger person was like, it was important that I be a conservative. When I was starting to work on CTV, I was sort of brought on as like a conservative pundit that they could have opposite a liberal or an NDP pundit, and there could sort of be conflict. Because, you know, yeah, the networks want conflict, but they also want, yeah, and I think rightly so, the viewers to see multiple sides of an issue. And so that was kind of the function that I played on CTV. 
And then when I worked at Sun, which you're right, is the kind of like more conservative station, or at least was, it doesn't exist anymore. That was a network that was basically like all conservative commentary all the time. In fact, they even like quite explicitly basically got rid of their kind of hard news sort of side in favor of what they described as a model that was like talk radio on TV. And so as a result, I became a sort of conservative commentator that contributed to the general sort of atmosphere of conservative commentary that that show delivered all day, every day. And then sort of through that, I kind of got more involved in kind of conservative world more broadly. And like, cons I met more like conservative politicians and conservative activists and went to like conservative conferences and things of that sort. And then that all has a sort of pressurizing effect as well, where you do sort of feel the social pressure to prove that you belong in these sorts of spaces and that you, you know, agree with and like these sort of people that are giving you opportunities and so forth. That was probably when I was sort of like, you know, at my most kind of conservative, or at least sort of outwardly presenting myself as the most conservative. But I suppose there was always a bit of self doubt in the back of my mind about it. Like, did I really want to be this partisan and this ideological of a character? And as well, like this sort of makes you kind of think like, well, what does it mean to be conservative? Like you can be sort of temperamentally conservative, which is to sort of say, be a sort of cautious person who's perhaps a little bit skeptical of uh, radical change, certainly, as opposed to just being like a completely like very ideological conservative, which is somebody who has, you know, just kind of like across the board, kind of very hard edged philosophical partisan opinions on issue one, dot, 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 dot. And that, you know, you can bring any issue towards you and you're immediately like have your instinctive conservative reactive position on that. And I think this has only increased in recent years where conservatism as a sort of political philosophy has, I think, in some ways become much more unapologetically kind of reactionary and populist in a way that, you know, is probably harder for me just dispositionally to relate to. So, I mean, it's been part of my ideological journey. I still identify, like broadly speaking, as conservative in the sense of like, I'm not part of a left wing tradition and I don't claim to offer anything that comes from a explicitly progressive leftist point of view. But at the same time, like I am becoming, I think, more moderate in my age. But that's also just because I kind of feel like the moderate analysis is ultimately the more useful and honest and objective one. I think if there's anything that like conservatism has going for it, it's the evidence that total revolutions don't have a very good track record. The world was built on, on incrementalism and, you know, cautious change. And so that kind of conserve, like the conserve part of conservatism at its core is a wise approach to life. Yeah. The fact that it can sometimes get bundled up with like the oil lobby is unfortunate, you know, because you're like, that probably isn't really rational. You are conserving a thing, but that's probably not a good thing to conserve. It's a complex topic of conversation, you know, the idea of conservative philosophy, which is very new philosophy, right? Like it's it's very much a kind of like post-war phenomenon, the idea that there could be a coherent sort of bundle of positions that are identifiably sort of conservative and exist in opposition to, you know, the kind of liberal progressive tilt that had otherwise been assumed to define the course of the 20th uh, century. You, it sounds like you always were like self-propelled, like you were always like into platforming yourself and giving giving yourself this kind of like fallback. Did you decide when you started doing YouTube, like, was this a conscious thing like, okay, I'm doing this full time now? Or it, did it just like, well, you have, I have free time, so I'm just working on it while I do other contracts? It was, it was more that because like basically the genesis is that when Sun News shut down, I suddenly, yeah, I had a lot of free time on my hand. I realized that I, I do like being on camera. Like, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm kind of natural and comfortable being on camera, speaking extemporaneously and all the rest of it. So I was like, I'm of the generation where I, like, I definitely did not grow up with YouTube. And YouTube was like, you know, something that was not a big sort of cultural touchstone for me. But by that point, and this was like in 2015, I was sort of like becoming aware that this was a bigger deal than I had previously thought. And so I was like, huh, I wonder if I could be a YouTuber. It doesn't seem that daunting. So I just like bought a camera and I started setting it up and I started filming myself. But yes, I did have other things in the background as well that I was working on. I was still doing writing and even illustrating sometimes on a kind of freelance basis. And then around the same time, I also got a job uh, writing for the Washington Post, where I've been working for, you know, the last, I don't know, five or six years, 
writing weekly columns because I still do like writing a lot and I like writing political columns and political commentary like as much as the television sort of side of things has become less attractive to me writing you know writing is still something that's very fun and very enjoyable to me and very intellectually stimulating and the fact that my job at the Washington Post is that I write about Canadian politics for an international audience is I think an interesting you know kind of writerly challenge which I very much enjoy like the challenge of writing in a way that both Canadians who are deeply familiar with Canadian politics can get something out of, but then also writing in a way that foreigners who don't know very much about Canadian politics can also get something out of, like how you can kind of find that kind of comfortable middle ground without being too condescending, but then without also being sort of too impenetrable. But yeah, I mean, over the over the years, like the balance has kind of shifted a bit. And like, as my YouTube stuff has become more successful and more lucrative for me, the amount of like writing and sort of freelance stuff I do has declined quite a bit. And so now it's just, it's only YouTube and only the Washington Post. And those are like the two sort of. I have a friend and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm uh, going to talk to JJ uh, this week. And uh, he, like I brought you up before to him um, and he was like, oh yes, I'm a YouTuber. And it was funny. It was the Washington Post. It was like this validating stamp that some people just need, you know, like, oh, uh, that's been around for 150 years. That's what it needs. And you're like, I mean, I don't know what you need, man. Like a million people are watching his video on this thing. Like it's more eyeballs than this article in the post. But it so much depends on like who I'm talking to at any given moment, right? Like if I'm talking to an older person, I will always lead with I'm a columnist at the Washington Post and they like immediately grasp the significance of that and are impressed by it. But if I'm talking to like, you know, somebody who's under 30, then I tell them I'm a YouTuber and then like that's the thing that like really gets the stars in their eyes and like gets them to take me seriously. Like, do you think that your skill set is was forged in this kind of old media world? Because I will say, like, your output and your kind of professionalism with your approach to your YouTube channel is something that separates you from from me, at least. You know, I don't have that discipline. So is it, are you basically using s s techniques around kind of like writing to deadlines and stuff? Do you... My ability to just, like, churn out a video every single week that I think is of a pretty consistent quality and then always get it out by Saturday. I kind of feel like a lot of like my self-discipline at that, which sometimes, you know, does impress other people is a product of just coming from a background where in the journalism business, you just kind of have to be able, you have to be kind of like on call. You have to be able to churn out things at relatively short turnaround times and deal with consistent deadlines and all of that. And I've been writing, you know, writing 800, word columns for years and years and years. And like a script is like 2000 words for one of my videos. So it's like that amount of writing is just not intimidating to me in a way that it is intimidating for other people. You know, I don't want to be too sort of patronizing to people. But like, these are skills that not everyone has developed, perhaps to the same extent that someone who comes from my background does, like sort of how to form an opinion, how to express an opinion, right? Like how to make an argument, like these are kinds of things that people learn, and people can learn them in a lot of different ways. But I've learned it in this particular way, coming from this background of opinion journalism that I do. Well, it's 100 percent like I only realized, I think this year that 2000 words was the number <laughs> for the length of video that I want to make. And I just hadn't realized what was causing me so many problems was that I was writing more than 2000 words, which made the edit just it just put it into this realm of like really, really fucking hard and made my life miserable in a way. And it all starts with just the script is too long. How do you approach it when you're kind of, um, do you structure your script like intro, you know, point, 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 uh, final, and then you kind of like, you know, like know how long it's going to be before you start? Or do you kind of more type away and then when you hit 2000 go, I need to solve this problem now? It's, it's much more sort of like the latter. Like, I guess I've been writing for so long and writing these kinds of things for so long that I kind of have a sort of sense of sort of like the natural flow of it. Like I can start writing and I can kind of like sort of know the journey that I'm going on. <laughs> you know, if you think of it like a hike, like you're you're on a hike and you've been hiking for so long and you're sort of like, okay, I'm a, probably about the halfway point now and I should probably be sort of like, you know, planning my descent at this point. And like there's, there's sort of a natural rhythm to it that kind of comes. But remember this and remember it well. The script is like 2,000 words. The other thing that too I've, I've sort of realized, and I think this is something that you realize in journalism, is that you don't have to have as pretty of a conclusion as I think that sort of younger journalists 
specialists or less experienced sort of people sometimes assume like that they kind of they're very much sort of in the mindset of like how you write when you're in high school, which is very much like, you know, introduction, argument, evidence, 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 conclusion, you know, denouement, this kind of thing. Right. And the other thing, too, is that, you know, and this is this is actually one of like the best sort of pieces of journalistic advice I ever heard, which is that not everything you write has to express every thought you've ever had on that topic. And I think like that is something that a lot of, frankly, I think a lot of YouTubers struggle with, right? Is that when they make, and I have friends that struggle with this problem all the time, is that if they want to make a video about a topic, suddenly it has to express every thought, every fact, every bit of information that has ever occurred to them on that topic or exists on that topic. And then they get very overwhelmed by it. And you're right. Like, and then the video becomes too bloated. Journalism teaches you that there'll always be another opportunity. You can always revisit this topic again. There's always another call, right? And you don't have to be quite so petrified about redundancy. And I think that sometimes YouTubers can get a little bit too sort of precious about their, their commentary and view these videos as like these perfect, you know, exquisite objects that are going to sit on the shelf forever. When, you know, really you can, there's nothing that stops you from making another video about that topic at some point to revisit it or make a different argument or explore the topic in some other way. So, I mean, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this because I'm not sure if I'm making a mistake or not, but I've been serializing videos into this kind of more narrative story. So, you know, before I would have tried to be like, actually, you know, it's a good example. You, you were doing like leaders of the world or something like that was a series you were doing. All of the leaders of nations that start with the letter A. Number one, Afghanistan. So let us begin now with the Bs. Country number 12, the Bahamas. Today we finish up the Cs, mostly. More recently I've realized it's more enjoyable to create a serialized format like dictators of the world, um, reformists of the world. So you can kind of stand alone, watch the videos, and they don't necessarily tie to each other, but it is, but the algorithm will kind of feed them to people <laughs> one after the other, you know? Yeah, I, I do. I like, I, I am, <laughs> you know, and you learn by, by trial and error, right? I did, I was at one point going to make this sort of series of videos where I was going to talk about every leader of the world. And you're right, like I was going to do it in this rigid sort of alphabetical sort of format, like that kind of like very linear format I don't think plays well on on YouTube and in the same way it wouldn't play well in in journalism like you could imagine like if you picked up the newspaper and there was like an opinion column that was sort of like you know part seven in a series it's like that in, initially becomes intimidating and off-putting because you're like oh now I have to like go back and do all of, find all of the other previous you know six entries and when I look at like my playlists and stuff that I make now on YouTube it's not like part one, part two, part three. It's like, is there some sort of like broad theme that unifies these these videos together? And then when I make a video, I can sometimes refer to and sort of say like, as I talked about in this video, and like, you should go and watch that to sort of fill in some of the gaps of, of what I'm discussing now. I think that's just kind of a much more natural way of communicating information. Uh, I think it always has been, but I think it's definitely even more well suited for, you know, the internet age and the YouTube age where people do prefer to consume things a la carte as they strike their fancy rather than in a kind of rigidly sort of serialized uh, way, which I think works better for like a format like, say, a podcast where, you know, you get like a, a very sort of steady feed and you can sort of consume it in that way as opposed to something like YouTube where it is much more of a kind of like what you're into at that moment. And of course, the sort of the organic discoverability of it. It is kind of uh, hilarious that we are literally talking about this doing a second take of an episode that was exactly the mistake <laughs> that we're talking about, right? So let's get started with the Globe and Mail. Okay. Globe and Mail is like, uh, well, Globe and Mail is like Canada. I believe it's Canada's oldest sort of continuously operating national newspaper. Well, not that there's much competition for that. There's really only two national newspapers. Trying to like in a linear fashion process all the Canadian media. And it's like, we, we experienced it. It becomes redundant after a while. You're like, oh yeah, well, whatever, fuck the Calgary's newspaper. Yes, yeah, pretty much the same story as this one's newspaper. You know, it's better just to like group the general topics being like, okay, so the National Post papers, that's this category. They acquire them in various markets. They kind of standardize them. And then now we've said it, you know, um, that's what, that's how human beings talk where, you know, like invite someone around to dinner and be like, okay, so we're just going to go through. <laughs> people get all revolting 
that if you try to have a, a conversation that's too rigidly structured. Yeah, right? I know. And it's not, it's like, I don't want to do that anyway. It's kind of weird that you, in a method, I guess, to try to create some sort of semblance of structure, you can end up like missing the point. But I mean, these are the lessons we, we learn, right? So, I you know, I, I, it's great. I learned that lesson right in front of your eyes. <laughs> What do you think of streaming? Because some people think that that's to some degree where things are going to go or that's a career that people should get yeah, into. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not super into streaming and that's not like a value judgment. It's just not really sort of something that I've I've had much time for or I've made much time for, I should say. I mean, I do live streams on my own channel once in a while. I did one last night, actually, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, they're pretty exhausting. Streaming to me seems very analogous to talk radio. And talk radio has been tremendously successful, right? Like it was one of the great forms of, of sort of public commentary that was developed in, in the latter half of the 20th century. And I think, you know, you have to be sort of receptive to that success. And it is interesting how much sort of like stuff in the modern era often just kind of seems to be a kind of retooling or rediscovery of various 20th century sort of successful <laughs> like you know how often you're advertising stuff on youtube and you're kind of doing it in the way that people sort of advertised in like early 1950s television where it's like you know oh buy this water a refreshing taste when you need it most like that's like a very sort of like old-fashioned kind of style of advertising but it works right which is why it sort of come back this show would not be possible, but for the sponsors. I like them a lot, half the price of competing earbuds. I get the Raycons. Was stimmt denn nicht mit Raycons? Always milder, better tasting, and cooler smoking. Silver and gold, silver and gold. Everyone searching for silver and gold. It's I'm trying to get a little bit more into just consuming streamer content because I think some of these people are like enormously charismatic and are very entertaining and they're fun to spend several hours with in the same way it was fun to spend, you know, several hours listening to these, as I did when I was a young kid, actually, I used to like spending a lot of time listening to talk radio in like the car with my parents or on my little radio by my bed at night. Billy's mother didn't know the real reason why he didn't want to go to bed. Only Joe in Chicago, hello. Hey, uh, what would you rather be? Uh, racist and alive, or not racist, and Ebola stricken. I would like to get more into it. I don't know if I necessarily have the skill set that kind of like the endurance to talk quite so long. You have like two hours in the tank, it seems, and once you get to the end, you can kind of tell. Also, the questions become repetitive, and then it's like, it feels like you're in some parallel universe of like, wait, what did you, was I, I think I, I said that, what? <laughs> you know? So it starts to become like irritating, right? I would say that you're pretty high energy. And what I noticed, uh, like I've got a friend who's a big streamer and he kind of like paces himself more and is like just, a, he's just got less energy and kind of long games it. So, you know, your natural place in streaming may be a little bit more like, one hour or two hours every week rather than like the everyday sort of deal. The challenge is like for me, particularly with YouTube and like not to, you know, kind of pat myself on the back here, but it's like because my channel is relatively popular, if I stream, I get bombarded with questions very quickly and I get bombarded with, you know, super chats, which are like people asking me questions that they've paid to ask. Right. And so like that feel like, well, I owe these people my time since they're paying to engage with me and like. So then I try to answer as many questions as I can. I just go kind of go through the list mechanically, but that really just kind of consumes the entire two hours is just me answering nothing but super chat question after super chat question, which is fun. And like they ask a lot of really interesting and stimulating questions, but it does become exhausting and it does become repetitive. I would like to see, um, I've experimented with this a little bit in the past, is like doing streams where people can literally call me as if it was an old fashioned talk radio show. Hey, how's it going, Paige? What's on your mind? And then we have like a bit of a sort of natural organic conversation. And then you can kind of like manage it and be like, okay, now we'll go to our friend uh, Bradley from uh, Vermont. And what's on your mind, Bradley? We should send that Canadian caller to Putin salt mines. The Canadians used to be a good, strong people. Now they're nothing but weak socialists. You seem a little upset, uh, Keith. I like that vibe a bit more. Like, I like sort of trying to sort of manage people and having like an organic conversation rather than just sort of like reading stilted uh, text. But I mean, like the, the problem is, I mean, as far as I know, the technology is not really there yet in 
that there's like a good medium for having those kind of like random call-in type of things? I gotta say, I actually looked into this relatively recently for a friend who was doing exactly that, and the technology is there. I mean, you need a producer like to help you, otherwise I think it's quite overwhelming screening calls and also presenting. Like, it's kind of crazy, like you said, right? Like, we just kind of go round and round in circles when it comes to this stuff, and we come up with new names for it, right? Like, talk show hosts used to have you know, this comfort to the audience and the familiarity. And now we call it like a parasocial relationship. But it's the same thing. The future in some ways belongs to those who learn basically just how to revamp an old idea. I think that sometimes there becomes too much of a fetishization of like, what's the next new thing? And people come up with these ideas that are very innovative and clever, but are in some ways sort of like too clever. And it, the public kind of has a resistance to embracing a radically new way of uh, of engaging with content or of engaging with their fellow man and stuff. If I was investing, I'd be more likely to invest in people that bring back technologies uh, from the past that were very successful in their own time and think like, is there a way that we can sort of like update and modernize and make more efficient those kind of projects, right? So it's like you're sort of thinking like, yeah, the call-in radio show, like I would like to sort of see someone who could come up with a, like a really efficient technology to make this very mainstream and very common and very easy to do in the same way. Like it would be sort of interesting to see if the idea of like a conventional talk show, you know, where you have guests and, you know, a studio and all this kind of thing, like, is someone going to come up with like a version of that for the 21st century? I'm, I'm just very sort of curious to see how much the this coming century and the coming decades in it really do, in an entertainment sort of sense, resemble much more the 20th century than I think we previously assumed. Because like humans are humans, and humans like engaging with, with other humans in, in certain, I don't know, very standard ways, ways that relate to sort of conversation and, and you know companionship and intimacy and all of these sorts of things. So the technology of the future that I suspect will be more successful are the ones that learn from the past and try to replicate those experiences rather than try to like, you know, condition humans to embrace radically new forms of engaging with each other, like, you know, the metaverse or whatever, right? Mm, yeah. How do you feel about like, um, you know, the future of work and remote work? I guess I'm probably a little bit more uh, bearish on it than some are. Like, I, I definitely think that like with the pandemic, we have realized that we do have the technology to do a lot more stuff remotely. It, like it took us too long to realize that. Like I think that if we if we were imagine like talking to like our grandchildren, you know, decades from now, it'll seem a little preposterous that it took us until 2020 to start doing as much remote stuff as we do, because they'll sort of say, "Well, did you not have the capacity to do like video calls in 2012?" And it's like, "Well, we did, but we just didn't feel like doing it, right?" Whereas in the 2020s, it does kind of seem like we've passed a point of no return in terms of the normalizing of that. But that said. I also kind of feel like the human's desire to sort of like spend time with other people is not something that we should sort of underestimate. And as much as, you know, people hate in-person meetings, I think people hate Zoom meetings. I mean, it seems like equally as much if they're not productive, because then there's kind of like this sort of a, a novel form, I think, of claustrophobia of being sort of like stuck in your own kind of space, having to engage with this screen, which is like very performative and like having to be look like you're engaged and not look like, you know, you're off doing your own thing, distracted with your phone or whatever, right? And I think as well, like when I think of my own like work uh, schedule and like how much my own productivity often improves when I'm just in the company of other people, like even if I'm just quietly working on my laptop over here and have my, my friend quietly working on his laptop over there and we're both editing videos and we're not talking much, there's a kind of organic uh, productivity enforcement dynamic that sort of kicks in yeah. because, you know, there's a kind of sense that we're holding each other accountable through our presence. And I think like that that's part of why we go to work, why we go to work as physical places, even if we've never really been able to like explicitly articulate the value of that, the working from home format during the pandemic has sort of like maybe made us realize that like this other way, and this is like a very sort of like conservative argument to be making, right? It's like maybe the old way had some use to it that we didn't fully appreciate until we tried to tear it down and replace it with something else. I don't know about you, but when remote work kind of came in for people during a pandemic and people were like, oh, it's awesome. I get to stay at home. I was always like, man, I was always 
envious of the people who got to leave their bedroom and go to work each day. Like if it was free, if office space was free, I would have an office and I would go to it like most oh. days of the week because that's a, it's actually, to me, it's a luxury. They were getting the free coffee and the beer fridge and all this nice stuff um, that I wasn't getting. I only had less than them. And it's been interesting watching them over the last two years slowly kind of being like, you know, I actually don't like being around my kids all the day. Like, you know, like you, you start to see them realizing like what they're actually losing. Like humans are like creatures of routine, right? And I, I think like that's something that I have not liked about my current lifestyle or the lifestyle I've been living for, you know, long before the pandemic. You know, like your days just, they kind of all blend together. They don't ha like, you know, I can roll out of bed and go straight to work on my computer and then go back to bed and quite like a weird thing that I'm often like weirdly sentimental about is like when I was in grade school, right? And I just think about like when I was in grade school, how I got up in the morning, and like I would go to school, and then there'd be like lunch hour, and I would do that. And then I would, you know, we'd have all these different classes throughout the day. And then I'd go home at the end of the day, and I'd eat dinner with my parents, or sometimes I'd see my friends in the evening, just like that kind of like hyper structure lifestyle, uh, which I often imagine like, you know, normal working people have to some degree, they're still sort of living through the kind of the school style lifestyle where they get up at an hour and eat their breakfast and go to work and then come home and da 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 da, as opposed to the amount of self discipline that you require in order to be a, a self employed work at home type of guy, as much as I like to think I'm a man of strong character and self discipline and all the rest of that, I know that, you know, sometimes you need a bit of external help. And I think that that's something that the traditional working life offers and that yeah like you said i think people are becoming a little bit more um i don't know a little bit more wistful for now that they've not had it a lot, a lot of people have said the pandemic has passed so quickly in this weird way because we haven't had life punctuated by events like we used to you know christmas parties commutes you know hanging out with people um so that sucks because it literally makes your life seem shorter and we're only here for what 70 80 years so that's that's not good the actual value of the work hygiene that's enforced by a workplace is substantial you know i really missed when i when i left my last job and started doing this i miss colleagues so much i really really liked them and it was nice to have someone to just you know, you, at lunch, you spin the chair around and you go, what do you think of this? It's like, I just, and it's not the same through a screen. You know, I have like online friends, you know, like, yeah, like I could, I could send you a message being like, what do you think of this? But it's just not, I don't know. It's that kind of like spontaneous conversation. Hey, let's get a sandwich and we'll talk about it. Sort of, I really loved that. And I, and I yearn for it again. I hope one day I can figure out how to get my life with that back in it somehow you know what i mean no for sure and it's like i've i've started in the last year in particular i have started hanging out more with other youtubers like both in sort of like the vancouver youtuber community they've started to sort of put more effort i think in sort of like networking with each other and like creating spaces where we can all hang out together which has been very useful and and also just like i've been making more youtuber friends i mean they live around the world but some of them i've been able to visit and work with and that's been a lot of fun like Neighbors. Now let us see what the correct answer was. Neighbors. So Chris's superior knowledge of Australian television gets him the point. Uh, having people that like you can kind of speak the same language to in a sort of face to face way, the language of work, whatever your work is, like you want to be able to talk about it in a way that can be sort of free flowing and, and organic and not just always in this narrowly transactional. Did you get my memo? Please respond by 12. You're a homosexual. I have been told that. Yes. What's that all about? I don't know, it's just who I am, I suppose. You mentor each other, right? Because often you'll have different skill sets, like you're f further down the line in say, like writing, but like maybe I have a skill set in finance and it's like you're, you can up each other's game through just this proximity of these relationships. And when you're alone, you're just, you know, it's, it's just a lot harder and you, w I probably have pissed away <laughs> two years of my life writing 4,000 word scripts if I was talking to you more regularly. I would have knocked that off a lot earlier. Have you ever looked into like co-working spaces or like is there like a YouTube creator space or something like that in Van that you can that you can go to? The Vancouver creators are definitely starting to get more into that kind of thing and and create like co-working spaces and stuff which is good and I've enjoyed being able to inhabit some of these spaces and get to know some of the local creators. 
don't mind me. I'm aware that this probably sounds snobbish because like, you know, we're talking about like a very small community of people and people that are sort of outside of those spaces can hear people like me talk about this kind of thing and, and be kind of envious or, or, you know, wistful and that they sort of wish that they had spaces like that, that they could be in. And I'm, I'm very sensitive to that because it's like, I've, I've worked in, there's broad public workspaces too, that I've done co-working spaces and those are fun as well. And it's like, because you develop, what do they call it? Like sort of found family kind of type of dynamics where if you're just working alongside people who start off as strangers and you don't know what they're doing and you don't like necessarily relate to the kind of work that they're doing. But it's just like just through the simple act of spending time with these people day after day, week after week, you can kind of develop an affinity for them that's sort of forged through just the simple act of talking and sharing and just these kind of like basic sort of human connections. So when we talk about things like co-working spaces and shared spaces and collaborative spaces, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be seen as this kind of like very high level elite thing where like elite creators like go off and do their own kind of cliquey thing and, you know, talk about how great they are in their elitist lifestyle. It can be a thing that's very achievable, I think, for anybody that is willing to sort of uh, make a bit of effort and maybe get a little bit outside of their comfort zone and try to uh, get to know people and, and sort of create a community that's forged by a common desire to have one. There is something like interesting with you, actually, in that like you, you entered the pandemic as like a kind of known to insiders sort of person. And now you're like a person that a lot of people would recognize. What happens if you go to the co-working space and then someone's walking up every day and like, hey, are you JJ? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it is. I mean, that is actually something. I mean, again, this is like a real kind of like elitist thing to be sort of complaining about or even reflecting on. But it's like, yeah, I have become more, my channel has become more successful over the last two years. And I have become more popular, not again, like to toot my own horn. But it's like when I go out most of the time these days, at least one person just randomly will recognize me and say, like, Oh, JJ, I love your videos. And it's very flattering. I like it. You know, I'm I'm as vain as anybody else. It's nice to be validated in that in that sort of way. It's 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 the kind of just the issue of what it means to be famous, what it means to be kind of recognizable as a sort of public person. And does that mean that you kind of have to be able to sort of like extract yourself a little bit more from the public in order to, you know, kind of have I don't know, a bit of a sort of sanctuary. And as well, so like your ego doesn't get too big as well, right? So it's like one of the good things about working with other creators, other YouTubers, is that there's a lot of YouTubers that are much more successful than I am and that I'm a little bit sort of humbled by their success. And it makes me realize that like I have a long way to go and that maybe I'm not such a big deal. And like it doesn't matter that like some guy recognizes me on the street. There's other YouTubers who like get recognized four or five or six or seven times every day on the street, right? So it's like when you're a successful person in any realm of life and you find yourself inclined to hang out with other people that are also successful in that realm of life, it doesn't necessarily have to be a kind of snobbishness that it's like, oh, I don't want to hang out with just ordinary people anymore because I'm too big of a deal. Sometimes hanging out with people that are successful can be an act of humility on your part where it's like, I need to be sort of brought down a little bit. I need to still feel motivated that I need to achieve more and not just kind of get a big head viewing myself as someone that's already made it. So that's definitely like something that I personally find that I get a lot out of when it comes to sort of collaborating or, or working alongside other YouTubers or just hanging out with them and, and networking and being friends with other YouTubers. It, it gives me that kind of motivation that I might otherwise not have and gets me away from the inclination to just kind of like rest on my laurels. Also a benefit of like maintaining old friends, you know, not forgetting to kind of like keep in touch with the people that like really know who you are and do just find you annoying sometimes and all that stuff, right? That's very important as well. And like whenever I've, you know, because I've heard a lot of uh, interviews with politicians and stuff over the years, and it's like people that become presidents or prime ministers or whatever, real big shots, they often talk about how important it is that they still keep in touch with some of their normal friends, like their common people friends. Because like, yeah, those people are on some in some respect, like they're never fully impressed by how high you go right like that, that you'll always be just you know jj or whatever from elementary school or whatever like they'll they'll have such a sort of deep and detailed knowledge of who you are as a person that they don't see you simply through the office that you hold or the number of subscribers you have or i mean it's it's very genuine and, and loving and and sort of like a deep affinity that has been forged over years but it's also 
you know, they, they know your true self and they, they know that you are a more complex and detailed person than just the kind of image that, you know, people have fallen in love with through the screen or, you know, through politics. Or, or whatever it is. You know, I remember when you peed your pants in class, so, you know, they'll always take you down a notch in my eyes. <laughs> right, and that's, that's good. That's, that's natural. I do think that, like, you know, modesty and humility are really important virtues in life, and vanity is, like, one of the most corrosive uh, sins that you can have as part of your character. So I, I try to sort of keep those kind of considerations in the front of my mind when I think about how I'm choosing to comport myself as I, you know, in theory, become more successful and more famous. And on that, when I uh, when I started out YouTube, I was like, oh, it would be cool to meet JJ one day because you definitely kind of like set the pace for like how to do the video essay format, I'm going to call it, uh, in Canada. And it was cool. When I uh, talked to Ute, Ute's like, well, who would you like to meet in Vancouver? I'm like, do you happen to know JJ? And he did. And we met and... It was really nice. Like you're, you are just a guy, a normal guy. Well, you're a strange guy, but you know, <laughs> you're a person you can talk to. And I thought it was very generous of you to, uh, to to actually offer that time and, and meet up in White Spot. I love to meet people. I love meeting people, I love to talk to people, and I love getting to know new people. I just really like people. At the end of the day. Mm -hmm.